Welcome back to Hiking with Kathleen. Today I'm at the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory. I'm on a day trip and I'm on my way to Crawford Lake Conservation Area where we're going to be looking at bats. Stay with me. I'm on one of the trails here at Crawford Lake Conservation Area. I just arrived in the park about uh, five, ten minutes ago. So I'm going to go and have a look around. The, the outing that I'm here for is going to focus on bats and that is going to come at dusk. So uh, right now it's you know at about four o'clock or so in the afternoon. So I've got some time on my hands in order to have a look around and I'm going to take you along with me.
What fascinates me most now about bats is the fact that every time I think I know something, I find out that I was mistaken and that there's more to the story than that, or perhaps the story's upside down. And this is, I think, what they call lifelong learning. But the point is that people often think that scientists are boring because they memorize all these facts. And of course, that's not what the excitement, the excitement is, you know, it's not what you know for sure that ain't so. It's what, no, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that ain't so. How do you prepare yourself for handling bats safely? A lot of that is preparation that's gone on for years. Um, part of me doesn't like wearing gloves when I'm handling bats because I don't have as much contact with them. And also, if people are seeing the picture, the gloves send the message that these are dangerous animals and you have to treat them carefully. But at the same time, if you use a light, the, as light a glove as you can get away with, and that'll be fine for small bats, then you get, you're more relaxed and the bat is more relaxed and you get better pictures. This is a male Eastern red bat. We can tell from his finger joints that he was born in June. Red bats are different in that females can have three or four young at once. More typically, bats just have a single young at a time. I'm wearing a mask to make sure that I don't breathe anything nasty on the bat. I'm wearing a glove to keep him from biting me or biting me in a way that would break the skin and conceivably expose me to rabies. Um, we're going to photograph this bat in flight and then we'll just let him go. This is a big conversation right now about people like me who have rabies vaccine and we have our titers and we're protected, we still get bitten a lot. And what are the implications of that? And as far as I know, it's not a problem. It's a, an opt, a problem of optics, but it's not a problem of reality. Um, put it another way. If I'm handling a bat and I get bitten, it's all my, my own fault because I shouldn't be handling the bat, right? I'm in his or her space. But at the same time, it's a small step to take. So the way we usually do it logistically, if we have a group of people, and for example, when we go to Belize, if you don't have rabies shots, you can't handle the bats, right? Now the problem with that is just getting the shots doesn't mean you have any protection. You have to have titer that shows you have protection. So now we start putting more and more rules in the way of people who might be interested in joining in. So that's a, a dilemma that you can never escape. Now you certainly would be in a very difficult legal position if somebody was with you and you didn't make sure that they had their shots. But I think you should not only make sure they have their shots, they should also have, have tighter so they've got protection. So it's a bit of freedom, you know, a little bit people don't, not liking to be bossed around. So to be clear, rabies is a virus, and if you get it, as soon as you show any symptoms, that's it for you pretty well. Um, it's almost uniformly fatal. So if you're not, if you're, you just ignore that, <laughs> I'm not sure what it means. <laughs> but it probably doesn't speak well for your judgment. <laughs> so there's a lot of things you can learn by studying bats where you just watch them but sometimes you have to know who they are. You want to make sure this is the same bat you were looking at yesterday. So that means you have to put some kind of a tag on it. And that usually means that you have to catch it to put the tag on. To catch bats, if you know a place where they're roosting, you can often go in and just grab them. That works pretty well. Um, may not be the most comfortable place in the world, but it's still something you can do. We also use fine nest nets called mist nets which are also used to catch birds. The bat gets tangled, you untangle it, now you've got your bat. We also use the harp traps or bat traps. This time the animal doesn't get tangled, but it still gets caught. So it's pretty hard to do some work without catching some animals. But sometimes you have animals that have distinctive marks on them, which allows you to know that that's that bat, because it has the same scar on its wing. and. But then, is it a male or a female? Is it pregnant? Is, you know, what's its status? So being, not being able to catch and handle the animals puts really big limits on what you can actually do. 
Some of the more interesting developments in bats involve more invasive things, taking a blood sample, taking a tissue sample, or sometimes putting a pit tag under the skin. And then a, the bat comes close to a reader, it, it records itself. So you have to decide what you want to know, what you're trying to learn, and what's the best bat to do that with, where's the best place to do it, and what's the most likely way to succeed. And if you don't do your homework, if I'm going to go somewhere and I haven't been before or I haven't been for a while, I want to refresh my mind about what bats I might catch there. I have to be able to know I'm going to take a bat out of a net. What kind is it? How do I tell? And those are all preparation things that you just get used to doing. So if you're going someplace exotic, I make a checklist of the bats I might get there and then I make a key so I can tell them apart. And if I don't do that, I don't get as much out of it because I don't know what the bat is in the picture and all those other problems. Terry Morningstar is a colleague. He's been working with uh, doing bat surveys and things for some time. Um, I've interacted him with a number of ways. The event he planned uh, last week was, I thought, just excellent. I was very impressed by the way, well, I know he's very thorough in what he does. And he gave a bunch of people his insight into people who study bats. And he gave the people that came to visit a chance to talk to bat biologists, ask questions, listen, interact. And that's, that's very important for scientists to do that. When you and Sherry work together on a project, describe what you are each doing. So we work together as a team. We take the pictures together. Um, we do different things in getting ready. Um, sometimes it's my turn to check the batteries to make sure they're not going to die halfway through the thing or make sure we've got the right lenses and everything, but we have a checklist. We go over our checklist together. So it's not gonna be somebody's fault if something's not there. You don't wanna think, oh, gee whiz, why did I forget that? We're interested in getting pictures of bats and birds or insects in flight. And we want that to be as natural as possible. Now, if we do that outside as a bat's coming out of somebody's attic or a tree, we get one shot and it's gone. Whereas if we catch the bat and bring it into our tent, we can set it up to optimize the camera, the, optimize getting the photographs, and you, you can't tell the bat where he's gonna be, but the photo, photography is based on the premise that the bat is gonna be there. So that's where your focus and that's where your light is, right? You're, it's in this place, it's not there and it's not there. And if you don't get it right, you won't get any pictures. What do you want the viewers to understand most about bats? That we, they're fascinating mammals and we don't know very much about them. And that became obvious in some of the question and answers that went on the other night. Um, they're intriguing. And you could say they're the magic, they're a magic well, because you keep going and every time you go, you find something new. And I think we are learning things, I mean, the little brown bats we saw, they weigh about seven grams. So that's about not even two quarters in your hand. And then to find out from some of the tagging that there, some of them are traveling two or 300 kilometers a night, you think, whew. And then you find out that some of them live to be 40 years old in the wild. Ah, so those are startling things and they don't get in your hair and they're not dirty or offensive. Yeah, sure, they'll bite if you give them a reason to and the opportunity. So you should try to minimize that. How can people buy your books? Ah, well, they can get them from online from chapters. Amazon, Amazon is selling them online. The day of the uh, bat outing reflected on the fact that I remember those days back in university yeah. when we would be coming in at three or four in the morning. Yeah. And yet we still had class at nine in the morning. And if you wanted breakfast, you had to get up before then. That's right. And so, if you didn't get up and catch the van, then you were SOL. Because we were driving all over Hell's Half yeah, Acres yeah. in order to get to another cave. And, but it's everything I said. You're getting along with people. You're working. Yeah. You work as a team. It's not that somebody's the boss and you have to do this and you have to do that. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's just normal, though. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. That's great. Thank you. My oh, pleasure. This, this, okay. is a, this is a wrap. So thank right. you so much for your time. I appreciate oh. that, Brock. And I appreciate your incorporating me into the outing the other day. Oh, yeah, it's fine. I mean